briefly, the case was a patient who was triaged at, with a complaint of anxiety um, and had some findings that were consistent with that and a history of that, um, and also some findings that were inconsistent and ultimately um, was found to be a victim of interpersonal violence. Um, and um, so we talked a lot about sort of some of the um, some of the like triage cueing type biases that happen, some of the anchoring and premature closure that happens when you um, when you think you know or you want to you want to be able to, to sort of ascribe symptoms to one thing despite maybe some subtle clues that it might be something else. And we talked a lot a little bit about sort of being able to listen to that kind of voice that sometimes you want to ignore um, that says maybe we should slow down and think of some other things. Great. Was there was there another group that had case one? How about case two? In the back here. Well, while the um, mic is being passed, I just want to point out that anchoring is one of the biases there, which basically is a form of premature closure where you anchor onto the first symptom. And in this case, it's kind of obvious they anchored onto this anxiety and put her in this category. Oh, it's just another psych patient. Um, anchoring is a form of, a, of, of what we call illness scripts or um, pattern recognition where you, rec you think you recognize this pattern. Um, and, and anchoring is not bad. Anchoring is where we start. What's bad is if you don't then go the next step, which is called adjustment. And that's where you debias. That's where you toggle into this more analytical way of thinking and try and, and tease out other things that might be incompatible with your initial diagnosis, your initial thought. All right, that's Okay, we had case two, which was a 21-year-old female um, who came in with a headache and vertigo, initially diagnosed as BPV um, and discharged. Later came back to the emergency department uh, and said maybe she had a concussion from a um, minor car accident. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then got, um, eventually ended up having a ver vertebral artery dissection. Um, but the things we talked about were that uh, she, there was a lot of um, diagnostic momentum, um, premature closure, and uh, basically confirmation bias, looking for the things that you would expect in those conditions. So what kind of strategies did you talk about to potentially mitigate those things? So, you know, anytime somebody comes back to the emergency department, that's a high-risk thing. A bounce back is a high-risk thing. So starting over, doing a thorough um, H&P, checking yourself, and, you know, forming that wide differential um, every time you see a, that person come back, and not just going off of what somebody else did. Yeah, my, my wife hates it when I say this, but, and I don't mean this to be in a religious sense of any kind, but in my opinion, a bounce back is God giving you a second chance. The other big group, uh, we kind of failure to get a, a differential diagnosis and, you know, kind of how to, to go about that. And in addition to just, you know, forcing, listing a whole bunch of things that this could be, actually listing that and then discussing them and defending why you would add that to your differential was something we talked about in addition to those. Now, how many people here have seen somebody with a vertebral artery dissection? How many have seen two people with a with a vertebral artery. How many have misdiagnosed? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very easy one to misdiagnose. This is my patient on the bounce back. And, uh, right, the same thing with posterior circulation strokes. Things that are really relatively uncommon are hard to diagnose. But if, and especially in emergency medicine, where for us the rule out worst case scenario is usually something that's catastrophic. Now, does that mean we have to throw everybody in the CAT scanner or the MRI or? Do an angiogram? No, but I think it means that we do have to be very careful about doing a thorough evaluation. History, thorough physical exam. In this case, yeah. the first visit, had they seen that she had an abnormal gait, that would have violated the first rule of BPV, which is a normal neurological exam. There are also things there, I think, like they had done a dix halpike maneuver and things that if this was BPV, you would have expected a different result from it. Um, and, and that 
was just sort of shoved under the carpet. We're not going to think about that piece of data that doesn't fit. So it's about like having that spidey sense to recognize those triggers when they're happening to make you go into a more analytic mode. And, and so just to, to, I'm sorry, just to add one thing, that's perfect example of confirmation bias. You do a test, it is abnormal, and you ignore that. So case three. Um, yes. All right. We had uh, case three, which was a, uh, a three-and-a-half-year-old boy um, coming in with uh, high fevers to 105, 106, um, and a headache, vomiting, uh, runny nose. Uh, and uh, the uh, physicians taking care of this patient seemed to kind of anchor on um, a diagnosis of bilateral otitis media um, because he'd had a past history of this and had a couple of things that pointed toward uh, an upper respiratory kind of a thing. Um, but he had some vital sign abnormalities. Uh, his pulse kind of kept going up, had um, widened pulse pressure, and uh, a lot of nursing documentation indicating some lethargy. Uh, ultimately, the patient bounced back uh, in arrest um, and couldn't be resuscitated. Looks like um, ultimately a missed uh, sepsis or a septic shock from uh, uh, strep pneumo. Um, so we talked a lot about um, some pre premature closure and... Uh, um, kind of stereotyping the uh, no, the you know, anchoring on these risk factors for um, and things that pointed to an upper respiratory process and uh, um, failing to rule out much more serious diagnoses. Um, we had meningitis on the differential too, which should have been investigated, and there was really no documentation to indicate that they even considered it. Did you talk about techniques to mitigate those? Yeah, so I mean, there were a, a number of points along the way that um, should have. Um, been kind of an alarm bell for reframing things and taking a second look, um, particularly some of the vital signs and these nursing notes about uh, lethargy and um, you know those are things that are concerning and uh, probably should have raised some alarm bells. Yeah, for in, in this case to see one note that says non-toxic, whatever that means, and another note that says lethargic, uh, that should have been a sign for the nurse and the doctor to have a little conference and and iron out what's going on here. Um, the other thing that came up was uh, the issue of stereotyping. And what's your name? Scott. Scott. Scott said that whenever he sees a kid who hasn't had complete immunizations, this kid's immunizations weren't complete, he gets more, uh, more conscientious about looking for something bad. Um, do you think the opposite might also happen? That when you see a kid who hasn't had all his immunizations, you might subconsciously or unconsciously think, oh, this mother isn't taking good care of this kid. So you have to be careful about, about your stereotyping biases, too. Great. So we're going to do case four. Um, okay, so our case was a young woman who was, well, I don't know how young she was, but she was uh, recently postpartum, I think 48 hours postpartum, and came into the emergency department with uh, subjective fevers and suprapubic pain was evaluated um, by uh, an internal medicine resident who uh, said she had her suprapubic area was too tender to examine, did a public exam otherwise that showed some vaginal bleeding, and they did some testing, uh, concluded that she had a urinary tract infection, um, and when in fact she was discharged and returned with uh, an, an arrest after um, endometritis. Um, and so we uh, identified really all three bins of uh, biases. Uh, there was some premature closure. Uh, there was also some uh, effective uh, biases. Um, she was sort of a lower socioeconomic status woman. Um, and then there was also sort of a uh, inappropriate prior probability of, of this disease that was not recognized. So really all, all of the above, um, probably the premature closure a little bit more than the others. We talked generally about strategies, um, sort of debiasing strategies. I don't know that we talked about specific ones for the case, if anyone wants to add. Yeah, I think you actually talked a lot of, uh, about a lot of great strategies, um, you know, one of which we use in emergency medicine all the time, which is rule out worst case scenario um, and kind of deliberately doing that for every case. Um, 
you, we also had a little bit of a discussion in our group about kind of diagnosis momentum that can happen as soon as um, either a nurse puts in a diagnosis at triage or your resident presents the case to you and you go in and see the patient afterwards. And so there were two of us in the group that said, I always go see the patient um, whenever I can before I hear the case presentation by the resident. And the reason that I do that is because two heads are better than one. And I completely respect that the residents are sometimes going to get information that I didn't, and I'm going to do the same. And that when we put those ideas together, it's actually a debiasing strategy. I think um, we're, we're kind of running out of time. Um, before I, we ask for questions, I wanted to end up by saying that this diagnostic timeout is something you probably should do at the end of every patient encounter. And it doesn't have to be a whole long thing. You don't have to go through this laundry list of, um, of potential biases. But you should ask yourself, is, this, is it possible that I missed something else? And have I excluded reasonably well all the, the bad stuff, the rule out worst case scenario? Have I done that? So I just want to draw your attention to a couple of references if you're interested in reading more about this. And then also, if you want sort of a downloadable workshop, this, this workshop um, with a couple alterations in the cases can basically be downloaded from MedEd Portal um, if you want it. Um, it would have the slides, the cases, um, and we're also, you can always contact by us by email because this MedEd Portal was put together about a year ago and then we updated the cases and the slides for this year. Um, but we're happy to share our materials because we just think this is so critically important for patient safety. So um, any questions before we wrap up? And I do have the, um, we have facilitator guides for the cases. And so if you'd like one of these when you leave, feel free to grab one in the back. And if you didn't get a handout, um, we've got a pink sheet of paper up here. Just put your name and email address on that. And uh, we'll send you whatever, we'll send you everything. <laughs> They're also available on the SIEM app. Um, the actually, yeah. actually, only the, um, they only allow us to The card that. is there, the yeah. The card is available on the SIEM yeah. app. And the slides, you can see those. Any questions? All right, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And, uh,